45. So why don't I go ahead and, and begin in that way, if uh, we have enough time, those who are here on time get the blessing of all of your information. Um, let me see if I can get this right. I've known uh, Martha since probably the late 90s, early 2000s, like when I mentioned last week with Charles, I first met them both when they were working with the Office of Worship and Theology uh, at the General Assembly. Uh, if I remember the background correctly, Martha has her undergraduate degree from Harvard and then her MDiv from Union Richmond and her PhD from Emory, and then did some work out in India as well. I mean, one of the few scholars I know who did work out in India. Uh, and then after all of that, went to work first uh, at the Office of Theology and Worship, and then did some teaching at Yale, and then finally went to uh, Columbia Seminary. How long have you been at Columbia, Martha? 20 years. It's been 20 years, wow. Yeah. Uh, and uh, has focused on Reformed theology, has written some wonderful books on prayer, uh, it's been my joy to reconnect with her uh, recently. I, I joined the board at Columbia Seminary, and so three times a year we get to see each other in person. Um, and uh, I found out when I was last at a board meeting that she and Charles and another uh, member of the faculty were doing a class this summer at First Pres Atlanta on the Barman Declaration. And I think that it's always important to spend time with the creeds and confessions of the church, but at this particular inflection, uh, studying the Mormon again is uh, incredibly important. And so I was grateful that she and Charles were willing to zoom in and do some teaching for us uh, um, and to help guide us in our thinking uh, this summer. So with all of that, Martha, welcome. We are so glad that you're here and I'm gonna turn it over to you. I should say that she has taught here in person before. So some of you may know her personally and will welcome her again. Martha, welcome, thank you. Thank you, thank you guys so much. And I'm delighted to be able to join you all this way, um, not being able to be with you in person this particular time. I don't remember that room that you're in. Is that a new construction since I was there? Or maybe I just haven't been in it before. Now that the fellowship hall may have been painted differently. Yeah, okay. I may just not have not, not been in that room before, but it is good to see you all. Um, so I'm going to share my slides. So once I do that, I won't be able to see you well, but I can hear you. And I do encourage, perhaps, perhaps with Guy's help, I encourage you to raise your hand, ask questions at any point along the way. Way. And then I'll make time for questions at the end. I am getting an echo of, of my voice. So I don't know if that's so something that we can fix or I will just deal with it. Is that is that affecting you all? I think so. Let me see if I can do something though. Okay. While you're doing Sorry. that, I will share my screen. So can you all see that screen okay? Yes. Ah, and, and I don't hear the echo anymore. So you've, I think whatever you did may have fixed it. I don't know. I definitely did something. Perfect. Well, thank you then. Thank you again for that, for that welcome. Um, I have been in conversation with Charles who was with you all last week. And so I'm delighted that you have had the opportunity to hear from him about the longer detailed history leading up to Barman. As I understand it, he really filled you in on um, some of the long lead up uh, during the rise to power of Hitler and the Nazi party leading to 1934, which is when Barman um, was written. So I'm gonna be spending my time this morning with you um, really walking through the Barman Declaration itself, through the content of it, and then thinking with you, I hope, about what this might be saying to us today and what it maybe is not saying to us today. Um, and so that's our, our goal for today. 
before we turn to that, though, I want to invite you to look at this slide that you see on the screen. And I am going to ask you all to respond if you can and tell me what you see. If you recognize these symbols or if you recognize one of these symbols, but I'm curious about what you see and what you see in the juxtaposition of the two. So I might have to ask for Guy's help here to translate. I'm gonna put the mic a little closer so maybe we can hear better. Too. Okay, great. So whoever wants to respond, I'm curious about what, what you see in these images juxtaposed on the screen. Well, the one on the left uh, has the swastika in the middle of the cross. Yep. The right has uh, the swastika uh, X'd out. Yep, I exactly right. I don't and, know what D stands for. Okay, does anybody want to make a guess as to what DC stands for on the left? It, I'll give it? you a again. German Christian. Yet somebody said, right, exactly. So this is this is German Christians, Deutsche Christen. Um, this was the flag that was designed for the German Christian movement uh, under Hitler. That is to say, uh, as we'll talk about in just a moment, the evangelical church in Germany, once it was recognized by the Reich, uh, by Hitler, um, and so you can see there just symbolically uh, the identification basically of the swastika and the cross. And then on the right, what you see, uh, as you noted, the, the swastika X'd out, this is a banner. I don't know if any of you have seen, uh, there's a series of banners that was developed in the late 60s um, to honor the Book of Confessions in the Presbyterian Church. When the Presbyterian Church first adopted the Book of Confessions, which we have now, um, there was there were a series of banners that were designed to go with each one of the confessions. And this was the one that was designed in, I think, 1968 to symbolize the Barman Declaration. I had not realized until recently how closely it is intended to echo and subvert that image on the left, that, that explicit flag of the German Christians. So I thought it's just an interesting uh, counter to, visually to be able to see what Barman was doing, what it understood itself to be doing, and how important it is for us to recognize the specific historical context out of which it arose. So I'll go to the next slide then. And... Um, and just recap, those of you who were uh, with Charles last week will have gotten a lot more than this, but I just want to uh, get us on the same page in terms of the basic historical context um, so that we understand where Barman came from. Um, you'll remember that after World War I, uh, Germany was in some economic and political disarray. And um, during the 1920s, uh, during this very difficult time in Germany's history, there was an for the National Socialist Party to really rise in power um, under the leadership of Hitler, among others. Um, during that period of time, uh, there was a, a gradual rise to power. And uh, then in 1929, there was, a, of course, the great market crash that affected us in the United States, also affected Europe, and, um, and affected the German economy in a way that sort of increased, accelerated even the economic destabilization in a way that also accelerated the rise to power of uh, the Nazi party. Along the same time, um, the German Christians, uh, that is to say, there were both Protestants and Catholics in Germany, of course. Um, but when I say Christians, I'm referring particularly to the Protestant churches in Germany. Um, who uh, gradually over the course of the 1920s and early 30s increasingly focused also their attention on the need to lift up the strength and purity of the German people so that the, the Christians themselves, not just the Nazi party politically, but the German Christians themselves were increasingly viewing Jews with suspicion as well as Marxists and immigrants, all of these peoples who were not white German heritage, particularly Protestant heritage, were seen as suspicious. 
And so uh, the Christians uh, during this time were increasingly seeking to build up their own identity as the national church of Germany. Uh, this came to one, one particular uh, historical moment that recognized this was on June 6th, 1932, as you see on the screen, where there was a, the official establishment of something that they named the German Christian Faith Movement. This was um, at that time, not yet an official church, but a, a strong movement within the Protestant churches in Germany that reinterpreted Christianity as explicitly anti-Jewish, even seeking to do away with the authority of the Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures um, so that they uh, really were hold, seeking to interpret Jesus as not Jewish, um, but as instead anti-Jewish. Um, shortly after that, as you can see, in October of that same year, there was a pushback among a small group of German Protestants, including a pastor named Martin Niemöller. Some of you may have heard that name. Um, and he sought to speak out against this kind of nationalist Christian identity um, and, and sought to say, no, the church is not identified with the state, is not identified with the nation. The church is free. And he named the, um, the language of confessing church as something that was central to the church's identity because he sought to, um, to talk about the way that the church needed to confess its own faith in a way that is not simply identical with nationalistic ideology. So there were several protests that emerged from this movement, which was called the, at the time the Pastors Emergency League. You can see that language on your screen there. Um, that was the group of pastors, both Reformed and Lutheran pastors, who sought, who, who really did identify the time in their national life as an emergency and uh, sought to say, we need to speak out because what's going on in, among the German Christians is not uh, really identical with the gospel. So we need to speak out and confess our faith in a way that is an alternative. In um, January 1933, that was when Hitler was appointed the Chancellor of the Reich. Um, and that was because his party, the Nazi party, had finally at that point gained the most seats. This was the first time this had happened. It gained the most seats in the Reichstag. So he wasn't elected president, but he was elected, called, appointed chancellor by the then president, President Hindenburg, um, who said, well, we need to give Hitler uh, an official position. And Hindenburg at the time apparently thought that by naming Hitler chancellor, it would actually be a way of trying to control his power. Because even at that time, Hindenburg and some of the other leaders um, were aware of the amount of power that Hitler and the Nazi party were um, were gaining, and they were they were beginning to be concerned. But they thought Hindenburg was finally convinced that by naming Hitler Chancellor, it would be a way to rein him in in a way, right? To connect him to the official political authorities in a way that then he would need to to have some kind of give and take. Well, as we know, it didn't work out. Um, he uh, very quickly began to assume more and more and more controls. Um, and after um, Hindenburg himself died in 1934, Hitler even more uh, became a, basically a dictator, um, merging the presidency with the chancellorship and assuming all authority for himself. Now, um, there is a, a description I'm going to share with you. This is from um, barred from the website of the current Evangelical Protestant Church in Germany, the EKD, uh, the Evangelische Kirche Deutsche. Um, that uh, that they when they describe historically what was going on, this is what they say uh, during this period of time, especially 1933, 1934. As he consolidated his power, Hitler abolished all political rights and democratic processes. Police could detain persons in prison without a trial, search private dwellings without a warrant, seize property, 
censor publications, tap telephones, and forbid meetings. He, that is Hitler, soon outlawed all political parties except his own. So notice, right, after he had become chancellor, because the Nazi party had the most seats by election, after that, shortly after that, all other political parties were actually abolished. So there were no other parties besides the Nazi party. Um, he established his own judicial system uh, with his own, he established, I'm sorry, he, he abolished the existing judicial system and established a new system, which we called, he called the people's courts, ironically, the people's courts, um, began institutionally terrorizing uh, Jews and obtained the support in all of this from the church leaders. Um, most Germans, and it's important for us to hear this, most Germans, Protestant as well as Catholic, took this union of Christianity and nationalism and militarism for granted. Most Germans assumed that church and state should be, were, and should be in alliance. So patriotism was equated with Christian truth. And all of that went along with the sense that what counted as true German identity was white, Aryan, Christian. So that was uh, gradually going on then um, from 1933 to 1934. And in 1933, we see the establishment officially of what was called the German Evangelical Church. That was the flag that I showed you at the beginning. That was their official flag. The German Evangelical Church, which included Reformed as well as Lutheran, as well as United Churches, but Protestant churches. Um, that understood themselves to be the official representation of the Protestant church in Germany. And they were officially recognized by the Reich government as the true German Protestant church in July of 1933. So this is all background then to what happened in 1934, when that group of churches that had been called together by Martin Niemöller in 1932, this clergy or pastors emergency league, which also came to identify itself with the confessing church, that group in 1934 said, this is enough. We need to speak out. Something needs to be said because what's going on in that so-called German Christian church is not what we recognize as the gospel. And so um, this group called for a, a, a meeting, a meeting, a national synod um, to be held at the German city of Barmen. This is how we get the name of the Barman Declaration. To prepare for that meeting, there was a small group of three pastors, two Lutherans and one Reformed pastor and church leader, who met to prepare. The Reformed church leader was Karl Barth, um, a professor at the time, theology professor in a German university at the time. The other two Lutherans were named um, Osmussen and uh, Bright. And these were the two Lutheran pastors. The three of them met in the middle of May in 1934. And the story goes that they were set to draft something that would then be brought to the Synod at Barman um, just a couple of weeks later at the end of May 1934. And so they had good conversation. They were um, in, they were met for a couple of days. And then um, after lunch one day, uh, the story goes, um, the two Lutherans went and took naps and Bart stayed up. And as he reported himself, empowered by a couple of cigars and strong coffee, drafted the bulk of what we now know as the Barman Declaration. Um, so it was brought then to the meeting at the end of May, the larger meeting of the Confessing Church, and with very minor changes was basically adopted. So that's the history. Um, for more, I just refer you back to what Charles talked about last week. But before we look at the Barman Declaration itself, I want to just remind you two slides from Charles, just to just to kind of underscore the importance of this declaration that was adopted by just less than 200 pastors um, at the end of May 1934. So here, um, I'll just read this and you can see it on the screen. This is a quote from Albert Einstein um, 
not himself a Christian, right? But looking back at what happened in the wake of Hitler um, and recognizing the Barman Declaration itself, he says this, being a lover of freedom, when the Nazi revolution came, I, that is Einstein, I looked to the universities to defend it, knowing that they had always boasted of their devotion to the cause of truth. But no, the universities were immediately silenced. Then I looked to the great editors of the newspapers, whose flaming editorials in days gone by had proclaimed their love of freedom. But they, like the universities, were silenced in a few short weeks. Only the church stood squarely across the path of Hitler's campaign for suppressing the truth. I never had any special interest in the church before, but now I feel a great affection and admiration for it because the church alone has had the courage and persistence to stand for intellectual and moral freedom. I am forced to confess that what I once despised, I now praise unreservedly. Striking, huh? This is Einstein looking back and looking at from what he from his vantage point, saying that that Barman, as the um, as the declaration of one small subset of the German churches at the time, was the only thing he could see, the only public voice he could see speaking out against the Nazi party. Now, of course, this is not to say that there weren't a lot of private citizens, as we know there were. There were plenty of um, quiet, right, subversive things going on. But in terms of public voices speaking out against the Nazi suppression of freedom, from Einstein's point of view, it was only this church statement that spoke out. And then this from uh, Karl Barth, looking back at his own work, um, similarly recognizing the 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 importance this the the significance of the Barman Declaration, and also recognizing its limits, and this is important, I think, for us to hear from Bart as the one who is the chief architect of this statement. I'll just read this for you, and then I'll pause to see if there's anything you want to comment on before we turn to the text of the Barman Declaration itself. So Bart says, in 1933 and the years immediately following, at the time the National Socialists seized power. There was no struggle of the German universities and schools, of the German legal profession, of German business, of the German theater and German art in general, of the German army or of the German trade unions. Many individuals, it is true, went down to honorable defeat. So he acknowledges, right, that there were, there were specific individual voices that spoke out. But in no time at all, those large groups and institutions were subdued and made to conform. It confined itself to the church's confession, to the church's service, and to church order as such. This is speaking about what the Barman Declaration was seeking to do. Um, in proportion to its task, the church has sufficient reason to be ashamed that it did not do more. Yet, in comparison with those other groups and institutions, it has no reason to be ashamed. It accomplished far more than all the rest. So here you see uh, Bart's acknowledgement that it should have done, it could have done more perhaps, but many scholars looking back now uh, are quick to say that given the circumstances of the time, it's likely that they could not have done more in terms of what the Barman Declaration says and doesn't say. For example, um, as we'll see, there is nothing explicit in Barman about Jews. There's nothing explicit about the anti-Jewish uh, oppression that was going on. And Bart himself regretted this later. But it is also quite possible that if there had been something explicit in the declaration, that it might not have been accepted by uh, everybody who accepted it. It might have been that if they said something more direct um, that it would not have passed. So, so there are limits to what it says. Let me just pause before we turn our attention to the declaration itself, just to see if there's anything you wanted to comment on about the history or about this assessment that I've suggested. Any questions or any comments for Martha? What was the timing of uh, Einstein's comment? That's a 
That's a great question. And to tell you the truth, I'm not certain. That quote was from um, a book uh, called Arthur Cochran. It's by Arthur Cochran, which was um, reflecting in the 60s, I think, uh, about Barman years later. And he that was a quote from him quoting Einstein. Um, so I'm not positive when the actual Einstein quote was, but it comes from that book, which is from the from the late 60s, I think. And then in the late 60s, uh, he would have been living right down the street from Princeton Seminary. Yes, indeed. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Ken, was he, was he in person while you were a student? I, I didn't meet with him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Was there any awareness in the United States or any country outside of Germany that this was brewing? That the you know yeah. this uh, confessing church was existing. That's a great question. There was some awareness because um, Bonhoeffer, um, you may remember Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was uh, a part of that movement. Um, had studied in at the universe at Union uh, Seminary in New York um, in the nineteen I think it was the nineteen twenties that he was there, um, and so he was a connection between the two countries. And then, of course, when he saw what was going on with the rise of the Nazi Party, even prior to nineteen thirty three, he opted to go back because he he regarded it as his his responsibility as a German church leader not to stay in safety in the United States, but to go back and be part of the resistance, which he did and which some of you may know uh, for which he lost his life. Um, so there was that very clear connection um, that that made some people, some church leaders in the States aware of what was going on with the confessing church. Um, but I think it's probably fair to say that that was a minority of people who were really aware um, of what was going on, yeah. So how about let's turn our attention then to the theological content of Barman. What, what you're going to see on the screen um, here for the next several slides is uh, straight from our book of confessions. So as you know, I think, as you will have talked about last week, uh, Barman um, is one of our uh, authoritative confessions in the book of um, confessions of the PCUSA. So this, this is our text um, but what you see, what you see on your screen, is the English translation of the text that came from 1934. So this is not um, written in America. This is the translation of what was written in 1934, originally in German. So notice the the very beginning here starts with, um, as it says, an appeal to the evangelical congregations and Christians in Germany. Just remember here. The language of evangelical in the German context really just means Protestant. Um, so what evangelicalism has come to mean in the United States is a later development. But what this means is just what we would say as Protestant. And in this case, um, Lutheran reformed and united churches. That's what that's who's con that's who's um, included within those so-called evangelical churches. And so this begins by just stating here, here are the dates of this synod, the Confessional Synod of the German Evangelical Church met in Barmen, May 29 to 31, 1934. Representatives from all the German confessional churches, let me just say a word about what that means. The confessional churches, um, all the churches in all the Protestant term, churches in Germany at the time understood themselves to be confessional churches. That is to say, all of them regarded uh, confessions of faith as authoritative uh, guidance for teaching and preaching. For the Lutheran churches, that would have been the Augsburg Confession primarily. That is still for Lutherans, the single confession that um, offers um, authority uh, for Lutheran theology. For Reformed churches, there were an array of others um, um, before the Barman Declaration, there were several um, uh, confessions that had come out of the 16th and 17th century reformations. So things like the Heidelberg Catechism, which is also one of ours. The Second Helvetic Confession, which is also one of ours, was an important one in Switzerland. There were 10 theses um, 
from the city of Bern in Switzerland that also were very popular and well-known um, in reformed circles at the time. So all of this is to say that there were several uh, statements of faith that had arisen, particularly in the Reformation time, that were important points of identity and sources for teaching in um, the Protestant churches at the time. And that's what they're talking about. So German confessional churches are basically all the Protestant churches at the time. But notice that this confessing church, this particular minority voice is really honing in on that language of confessing, that language of confession as central to the church's identity. So you see that language repeated. But here, um, this Barman begins by simply saying that all of these confessional churches met with one accord in a confession of the one Lord of the one holy apostolic church. Infidelity to their confession of faith, members of the Lutheran Reformed and United Churches sought a common message for the need and temptation of the church in our day. With gratitude to God, they are convinced that they have been given a common word to utter. Now, notice in this statement, there is not an explicit naming of what the need and temptation of the church is. It is assumed by the readers Right. It is assumed that people will understand what they're talking about here in terms of the rise of the Nazi party, the suppression of freedom, um, as well as the alliance, the close alliance of church and state um, and the suppression of the voices of Jews and others. But but just notice that it's not named here. You have to read that in. You have to know the historical background to infer what they're talking about in terms of the need and temptation of the day. This is later in that same paragraph. Um, it says, in opposition to attempts to establish the unity of the German evangelical church by means of false doctrine, by the use of force and insincere practices, let me pause there, that's as close as they get to telling you what the situation is that they're talking about. But, uh, but really to understand that, you need the history that you all talked about last week and we reviewed a little bit this morning, right? It's the use of force. It is the false doctrine, for example, the false doctrine that German, the German race is the highest and most pure race and needs to right, be the leaders of the world. Uh, that kind of teaching is what they have in mind when they're talking about false doctrine, but it doesn't tell you that. But just to go on, the confessional synod, that is the people who are gathered there at Barman, insists that the unity of the evangelical churches in Germany can come only from the word of God in faith through the Holy Spirit. Thus alone is the church renewed. And here we see here the, 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 the initial assertion of the main theme that's going to emerge in Barman, that the unity of the church, the faithfulness of the church only comes from the word of God. The, imp the implication is that that is not what the German Christians are doing. But again, you have to read that in. And so they go on um, to say, okay, so they, they laid out a little bit of the background and then they turn their attention here to the present situation of the German evangelical church. Again, so they're speaking to this German Christian movement that we talked about earlier. So when they say German evangelical church, that's what they're talking about. The German Christians who are in alliance with Hitler. So notice this, they begin by quoting the um, constitution of that church, quoting it back to itself. So here, according to the opening words of its constitution, July 11th, 1933, again, this is the German Christian church, the German evangelical church is a federation of confessional churches that grew out of the Reformation and that enjoy equal rights. The theological basis for the unification of these churches is laid down in Article 1 and Article 2 of the constitution of the German evangelical church that was recognized by the Reich government on July 14th, 1933. I'll just call attention to that date. Uh, that was a week ago, was July, a week ago today, last Sunday, was July 14th. So the actual day on which the Reich government recognized the authority of the German evangelical church as the true Protestant church in Germany. But here, they just quote, here's, here's the beginning of the constitution of that church. Number one, the inviolable foundation of the German evangelical church is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
as it is attested for us in Holy Scripture and brought to light again in the Confessions of the Reformation. The full powers of that church needs, excuse me, the full powers that the church needs for its mission are thereby determined and limited. So I just want you to notice that language, fairly non-controversial, I would think, right? The foundation is the gospel of Jesus Christ, attested in Holy Scripture, brought to light again in the Confessions of the Reformation. This is quite similar to what we say ourselves in the PCUSA. And it's quite similar to what we're going to see in the Barman Declaration itself. So just notice how uh, the, they're trying to say at the beginning that the, the very basis of the German Christian movement is right, right? They're affirming this. And then they're going to basically say, yes, you say this, you German evangelical church, but it is not what you are actually doing. And so that's the point. And so basically, so this is then the segue into the six basic statements of Barman. We, that is the confessing church, publicly declare before all evangelical churches in Germany that what they hold in common, that is to say what the German Christians hold in common in this confession is grievously imperiled and with it, the unity of the German evangelical church. It is threatened by the teaching methods and the actions of the ruling church party of the German Christians and of the church administration carried on by them. Again, not a lot of detail here, but they're assuming anybody reading this in 1934 will understand what they're Let's go on uh, six basic theses of the Barman Declaration. Uh, the, 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 the heart of the Barman Declaration consists of these six statements. They all have the same structure. So again, in view of the errors of the German Christians of the present Reich church government, which are devastating the church and are also thereby of the German evangelical church, we confess the following evangelical truths. Okay. So this is this is where they go. I'm just getting a message that my connection is unstable. Can I get an affirmation that you can still hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So somehow, yeah, let me know if you lose me. But here's the first one. is the most important. Um, and you'll see in this structure of this statement, uh, the basic structure of all six of the statements uh, that constitute the Barman Declaration. They begin with scripture and then an affirmation, and then a rejection. So notice that. This one then begins with a couple of passages from John in the words of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And then again, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. I, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Okay, so that's the that's the scriptural basis. And then perhaps the most famous line in the entire Barman Declaration is this one, the one that you see as numbered 811. That's the number in the Book of Confessions because the Barman Declaration is the eighth confession in our book. And this is paragraph 11. That's the reason for the numbering. So 811 says this, Jesus Christ as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God, which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. Let me pause there, and I'm going to flash back a couple of slides to show you something. But look at that language. Jesus Christ, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God, which we have to hear, and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. Okay, keep that in your mind. And look at this, Article 1 of, now this is going back to the German Christians. This says, the inviolable foundation of the German evangelical church is the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it is attested for us in Holy Scripture. That part is almost word for word, and brought to light again in the Confessions of the Reformation. Look at that. Then I'm going to go back to Barman, and you tell me what you see. Same, different. What do you see? I've already pointed out to you that this language of Jesus Christ as attested in Holy Scripture is almost word for word, right? 
You might have noticed also that in both cases, the name of Jesus Christ is there, right? So again, let's just go back and look again. The gospel of Jesus. So that's a slight difference. Here, it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the person of Jesus Christ. And I think that's not insignificant, right? Uh, so Barman is saying it's not just a gospel divorced from the pers person of Jesus Christ is the one word of God, which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey. So all of that is to say, there's a lot of similarity here. And part of what Bart and his co-writers were seeking to do was to call the German Christians back to what they themselves had already said. And I think to underscore even more strongly the personhood of Jesus Christ as the incarnate word of God, right? So that scripture is the word of God written. Jesus Christ is the word of God incarnate. And he is the one that we need to obey. So in a way, right, he's underscoring what do we know of God in the person of Jesus Christ? That's what we need to pay attention to. Also notice, this is not what we see in the constitution of the German Christians, but in the Barman Declaration, at every point, when you affirm something, there is also something that needs to be rejected. And here, the rejection, as it says, the false doctrine as though the church could and would have to acknowledge as a source of its proclamation, apart from and besides this one word of God, still other events and powers, figures and truths as God's revelation. So the point here is no other person, no other source is revelatory of God in the way that Jesus Christ is, as we see attested in scripture. We see here a very strong affirmation of the Reformation teaching about Christus solus or solus Christus, that Christ alone is the one in whom we are saved, and sola scriptura, the Holy Scripture, as the source by which we know Christ, right? We see this affirmed very strongly here at the beginning of Barman. No other source has the same authority. We should not trust. And here, again, the, the writers of Barman have in mind the sources that are arguing for the purity of the Aryan race, the purity and strength of the German nation as a people. Anything that would teach that, they are implying, is not in Scripture. There is nothing about the Aryan race in Scripture. Jesus Christ was not Aryan. Right. Uh, so but that's all by implication. You have to read that in. It doesn't say that directly. Let me go to the next one, um, just so we have time to walk through all six. And then I want to pause. Um, the second declaration, again, starts with scripture here. Just one line of scripture, Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The importance of this um, second mm -hmm statement in Barman is about the joining together of what we might call justification and sanctification or the forgiveness of sins by grace and the life of um, discipleship that comes also by grace. As it says here, as Jesus Christ is God's assurance of the forgiveness of all our sins, yes, and so in the same way and with the same seriousness, is he also God's mighty claim upon our whole life? Through him, that is Jesus, befalls us a joyful deliverance from the godless fetters of this world for a free, grateful service to his creatures. In other words, this affirmation is trying to say, in Jesus Christ, we are assured of the forgiveness of our sins. And in Jesus Christ, we are called, summoned, and empowered to service, to a life of service in our whole life. And it goes on then to the rejection. We reject the false doctrine as though there were areas of our life in which we would not belong to Jesus Christ, but to other lords, areas in which we would not need justification and sanctification through him. You can imagine who they had in mind here, right? Other lords, maybe Hitler, right? Maybe the Nazi party, Um they are pushing back against anyone who would say that the church is only about the spiritual side of life, but the political side of life is different, separate. Jesus Christ is not the Lord over our political lives, some people might say. 
Jesus Christ is not the Lord over our economic decisions, some people might say. And Barman is saying, absolutely not. Jesus Christ has the claim on our entire lives, political, social, economic, domestic, public, and church. Every part of our lives is owed to following Jesus Christ. I'll just walk through these others uh, quickly, um, and then I want to uh, give you a chance to ask other questions that you might have. Um, number three is talking about the church. So really, three and four both are talking about the nature of the church. Here, the quote is from Ephesians 4, uh, where Paul says, or whoever wrote Ephesians, says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body is joined and knit together. Notice again, the strong focus on Christ as the Lord of the church here as the head of the church, which is the body. And so again, the, the um, effort here is to reinforce the identification with what do we know of God in Jesus Christ? So it says this positively, the Christian church is the congregation of the brethren. We might want to say brethren and sistren in which Jesus Christ acts presently, notice, not just in the past, but also in the present, as the Lord in word and sacrament through the Holy Spirit. As the church of pardoned sinners, it has to testify in the midst of a sinful world with its faith as with its obedience, with its message as with its order, that it is solely his property, that is Christ's property, and that it lives and wants to live solely from his comfort and from his direction in the expectation of his appearance, right? Again, very strongly affirming the linkage between the church and Christ. What is the church supposed to be? The church is supposed to be the body of Christ, who is its only head, no other head, right? And also the strong affirmation here of this language of pardoned sinners and the sinful world, don't miss, right? The recognition, the strong recognition here of the sinfulness of us as individuals and of the world as a whole. That it's part of the church's responsibility to recognize and call out that sin and to declare its forgiveness and to live a life of service and discipleship that seeks to be in opposition to that sin. All of that is implicated, I think, here. And so then the rejection. What's the rejection? We reject the false doctrine as though the church were permitted to abandon the form of its message in order to its own pleasure or to changes in prevailing ideological and political convictions. In other words, the church is free, needs to be free to declare God's grace, not to declare the political convictions of the ruling party. Here in um, number four, Declaration Four of the of Barman, you see a continuation of attention to the church. Um, here, the quote is from Matthew: "You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant." So here, it's not just about the church as a whole, but about the leadership of the church. Who is who is to be the leader of the church and what are leaders supposed to be like? They're supposed to be like servants, not like dictators, not like authoritarians. And so it says explicitly, the various offices in the church do not establish a dominion of some over others. On the contrary, they are for the exercise of the ministry entrusted to and enjoined upon the whole congregation. So there's a call to the leadership of the whole and the equality of the whole people of God. Um, and what's the rejection? We reject the false doctrine as though the church, apart from this ministry, could and were permitted to give it to itself or allow to be given to it special leaders vested with ruling powers. And I've circled here that language of special leaders, because in the German, that language of leader is literally Führer. So you can imagine, right? This is not subtle in German. Um, this is a rejection of the ability of the political leader to name a leader of the church, which is what Hitler had done at that by by this time, by 1934, Hitler had it had named and endorsed um, the official leader of the German Evangelical Church who was in alliance with the Nazi party. Barman is explicitly saying that is not 
That is a false doctrine. That is not what the church is to do. And then um, we have a, a quick um, a quote that speaks to the relationship between church and state. From First Peter, fear God, honor the emperor. And here I just want to draw your attention to the verbs and the difference between fearing and honoring. Who is to be feared? God alone. The emperor or the state ruler, whoever that is, is to be honored. And so this uh, paragraph goes on to say that ordinarily, ordinarily we recognize that the state is fulfilling God's purposes of providing for justice and peace. It even acknowledges that sometimes that's going to require the threat and exercise of force. So it acknowledges all of that, but it rejects, and notice here you have two rejections, that's more than we've seen before. Um, it rejects the state assuming more authority than it is due. So 823 says, we reject the false doctrine as though the state over and beyond its special commission should and could become the single and totalitarian order of human life, thus fulfilling the church's vocation as well. So that's saying the state's responsibility, the state's authority is limited. It cannot do what the church is alone to do. And it also calls the church to account, saying we reject the false doctrine as though the church, over and beyond its special commission, should and could appropriate the characteristics, the tasks, and the dignity of the state, thus itself becoming an organ of the state. So what you see here is the insistence that the church and the state need to be understood as distinct. Um, in an era in which the concern was that the church had simply become an organ of the state, had become the church of the Reich. And finally, um, the, the last declaration um, of the list of six, lo, I am with you always, this is Jesus speaking, lo, I am with you always to the close of the age, Jesus says at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. And then Second Timothy, who says the word of God is not fettered. The emphasis here is on the free and present activity of Christ in the world. Um, by saying, I am with you always to the close of the age, this is the, this is the reminder that Jesus is still alive and around <laughs> and powerful and doing things in the world. And that is what this is calling attention to, right? And the word of God is not fettered. It is not bound by anything outside of itself. So the implication here is that the church is founded in the free grace of God to all people. The church, what, the, what is the church supposed to do in the world? The church is supposed to declare the free grace of God. And therefore, it is itself free. The church is, should be free to do its work of declaring the free grace of God. And so the final rejection then is the false doctrine as though the church in human arrogance could place the word and work of the Lord in the service of any arbitrarily chosen desires, purposes, and plans. Again, in the historical context, that is intended to refer to the political power of the day, um, that, the, that the work of the Lord is the proclamation of free grace and it is grounded in the freedom of Christ and the freedom of the church. So um, what I want to do here, I'm just going to put these questions in front of you. Um, if you would like to answer either of these, um, how was the gospel at stake in 1934? Then how was it at stake? What was the gospel that was at stake? And or you might want to answer this question. Are there ways in which the gospel is at stake here now today in our own context? I'm going to put those questions in front of you, and but I also want to invite, if you have particular questions that you wanted to follow up on, um, we can do that, and then I'll conclude by sharing a cautionary word uh, from a recent article um, about the Barman Declaration. But let's pause here for a moment. Are there any questions or any uh, attempts at answering the two that she's given us? Carol? A question is coming more the, about what was the position of the Roman Catholic Church in 34? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there was not an organized um, like group of Catholic leaders 
who spoke out in the way that the Barman Declaration did. But there were there were several individual Catholic leaders who did um, speak out. And gradually, um, as they did with the Protestant churches, the Nazi party under Hitler uh, sidelined those Catholic leaders who were speaking out. And in a variety of ways, they exercised kind of soft power. Um, and eventually, there were certainly priests who were um, led to their death, you know, at Auschwitz and other death camps uh, because of their opposition to the Nazi party. So there were plenty of Catholic leaders individually who opposed and lost their lives. Um, but there was not there was not an organized um, like uh, group that that uh, that spoke out altogether in the way that Barman did. The question to attend the attempt is the Barman Declaration saying there should never be a state religion. That certainly is the way that I read it. Yes. Um, if you want to go, we can just go back to this here. This is the fifth uh, thesis in Barman. And it is say it's trying to say that the state has a divine appointment and the church acknowledges it, right? Acknowledges this the divine appointment in gratitude and reverence um, and praise for the emperor. But it doesn't say this maybe quite as clearly as we might like, but um, but it certainly is trying to restrict the state to its role, which is not the same as the role of the church. Right. The church, what is the church's job? The church's job is to proclaim the free grace of God. What is the state's role? The church's, excuse me, the state's role is to provide for justice and peace so that the church can also do its work. But they're, but they're, so they might be in uh, alignment at some points in history. But I think that Barman is deeply, deeply suspicious of what happens when there is a state church that is the singular. Uh, state church affirmed and um, what, uh, yeah, officially recognized by the government because at that point, the church becomes an organ of the state, loses its own freedom. Martha, I know much has been written that Marx, as one of the three writers and perhaps the principal voice behind the Barman was not German, was in fact a Swiss, and was in fact a yes. reform, rather than a Lutheran. Yes. Uh, you want to say anything about his particular context in the midst of this, or or not? Um, uh, so I'm not sure what you have in mind, but it is it is important to recognize that. And I will show you one place where um, we can see the reformed influence. Here we are. Um, so this is back to the third um, line, the third um, thesis of Barman, talking about the church. This is the first thesis that talks about what the church is and what the church is supposed to do. And I understand that there was a there was a debate between Lutheran and Reformed, including Bart, uh, over the specific language of this um, when it says the Christian church is the congregation of the brethren in which Jesus Christ acts presently, the Lutherans um, really argued for the inclusion of the language of word and Christ acts presently as the Lord in word and sacrament. That was a Lutheran um, line that was added. And Bart agreed, Bart and the other reformers, reformed folk agreed and then argued for the inclusion of this Holy Spirit through the Holy Spirit. So that language, the insistence on the Holy Spirit as the um, person of God by which Jesus Christ acts in word and sacrament, that's what you see a little, um, uh, an explicitly reformed emphasis there. Um, that may not be what you had in mind, Guy, but I, I wanted to share that as an interesting little um what moment in the development of the Barman Declaration that shows the Lutheran and the Reformed both seeking to be represented. And the final result is, of course, something that they all agree to and we agree to. But the emphasis uh, on the freedom of the Holy Spirit, I think, um, is distinctive to the Reformed tradition. Was there yeah. more, Guy, that you wanted to add there? 
uh, I don't I don't want to take over just that uh, the political context of Switzerland uh, with the presence of the Reformed Church uh, historically all the way back to Calvin is substantially different than yes. the experience, especially around the two kingdoms. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you for that. Yes, that is important. And so with more time, um, we could certainly talk about the, the difference that it makes. The political, um, uh, the setup of the government actually does make a difference in terms of Lutheran versus Reformed um, history. Um, and so the the city, um, the rise of the imperial cities in Switzerland, as opposed to the um, more of the state church model that you get in the Landeskirchen in Germany, uh, it, it is a different thing. And just while we're talking about Bart, uh, some of you may know, but, but I'll just mention that uh, Bart did lose his position, his teaching position in Germany as a result of this, and uh, and went back and taught for the rest of his life, the rest of his career in Switzerland. So he, he did pay a price, um, although it wasn't with his life, um, it was with um, his teaching position. Um, so he was not he was never allowed to go back to Germany after this. Let me um, just end. I, I, I would be curious to know what you think about where the gospel is at stake in our own context. But uh, but I do want to make sure and and share this with you as a cautionary word. Um, uh, just published uh, last week, July 17th. What is today? Yeah, just this past week, uh, David Congdon, who is um, a Reformed uh, theologian in the PCUSA, wrote this article in the Presbyterian Outlook about his experience of teaching the Barman Declaration um, over the past many, many, many years. And um, I can send, if, Guy, if you don't have this, I can send you the link so that you can share it. But um, but but he Congdon points out that um, he's come to realize that Barman does not say anything specific about the historical context to which it is speaking. Um, and he says this, he says, each of Barman's six points is worded in such an abstract manner that unless you already know the authorial intention, it quickly becomes an empty statement that allows one to reject any authority for whatever reason. And he says this out of the observation that um, progressive Christians have long seen Barman as a rejection of Christian nationalism. So many progressive Christians today hear Barman as an indictment of, um, of Trump and Trump's America, as it says here. And in 2020 and 2021, a number of uh, more conservative evangelical Christians read Barman as a condemnation of the mask mandates as they were being instituted by governments, state, local, and federal governments um, during the COVID pandemic. And so what Condon is pointing out is that you can read Barman in a number of ways. You can read Barman as a condemnation of the use of government to require people to wear masks, or you can read Barman as a condemnation of the identification of uh, the United States as a Christian nation. And Congdon wants us to hear, and I think this is where I wanna end, we, we need to be careful about reading Barman as if it speaks directly into our own time. Barman is not gonna answer all the questions for us, but what we can ask is, what might Barman inspire us to confess today in our time, particularly the question about what kind of freedom is consistent with the gospel? The Barman Declaration insists on that the church is free based in the free grace of God, and it's called to proclaim the free grace of God to all people. And in order to do that, the church needs to be free. What exactly does that mean? for us today? And what do we then need to confess? So that's where I'm going to leave us. I have time, but I also recognize you may not have time because you may need to go to church and you are free to do that. So 
I will stay here and just thank you again for the invitation to be with you this morning. Martha, thank you so very, very much for being with us. We appreciate you and your uh, teaching and keeping this in front of us in such an important way. Uh, grace to you and peace. I'm going to sign off and I'll close in prayer after we leave. Have a great day. Thanks, Martha. Thank you. Thank you.